Welcome to episode 230 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to, once again, retired agent Stephen Chenoweth and Walter Lamar. In part one of this episode, they reviewed their bank robbery investigation of Terry Lee Connor and Joseph William Dougherty and their unique bank robbery method of identifying the bank manager and where he lived, holding him and his family hostage the night before, and then forcibly escorting him to the bank where they would empty out the vault. In part two of this episode, Walt and Steve review how a new court authorization to tap payphones aided in the nationwide manhunt and capture of Connor and Dougherty. I'm not going to read Steve Chenoweth and Walter Lamar's bios again. You'll find those in the episode show notes, but I do want to remind you when this case took place, Steve Chenoweth is a veteran FBI agent assigned to the Phoenix Division. And Walter Lamar is a new agent with just three years in assigned to the San Francisco division. But before we get to the interview, I want my reader team members to know that I sent out my May reader team email on Monday, May 3rd. So if it's not in your inbox, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and your promotion tab. In this issue, I write about the FBI's Most Wanted program and I review how the FBI is portrayed in the bank robbery movie, The Town. Have you noticed that there are no ads on FBI Retired Case File Review? That's because I hope you'll support the show by joining my reader team and purchasing my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books, available wherever books are sold. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. Once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And when you join my reader team, I'll send you my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 60 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. And you'll also get my FBI reality checklist of 20 misconceptions about the FBI. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. Welcome back to part two of our sleepover bank robbery case review. I'm here with retired agents Steve Chenoweth and Walter Lamar. Now, when we ended part one of this case review, we had learned that on June 19th, 1985, with a handcuff key and a razor blade, our bank robbers, Terry Connors and Joseph Dougherty, had overpowered two U.S. Marshals that were transporting them from prison to the courthouse. After their escape, the U.S. Marshals added Connor and Dougherty to their top 15 fugitive list, and the FBI added them to the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Even though they had escaped in Oklahoma City, Steve Chenoweth, who was assigned to the Phoenix Division, was named the case agent for the fugitive investigation, and Walter Lamar was in San Francisco following the case which had now become a national manhunt. So now that everybody's all caught up, Walt, you want to take it from here? Well, in July, July 12th, actually, of 85, Connor and Doherty, they robbed a Chippewa bank in St. Louis of $8,000. And on July 26th of 85, they robbed the Brentwood Bank in St. Louis. Now, one of the things that has been said of these two, and Steve alluded to it, talking about the fact that it's, it's like a drug, these robberies. Once they've robbed a bank and they got $700,000, they're not robbing other banks for out of any kind of desperation to feed a drug habit. They're, they're feeding the need for that adrenaline rush. But these two robberies in St. Louis were just a standard kind of robberies. $8,000 was yeah. change for them. And the second robbery was 27000 So what 
So what those were, those were robberies of desperation because they needed money. They needed to get their feet back on the ground. They needed to get back busy again. Now then, and I mentioned earlier about Dan Kraft in Milwaukee, September 3rd of 1985, Connor and Doherty, they carry out one of their signature style bank robberies at the Central Bank of West Allis, Wisconsin, where they their take was 574000 In the NIST case, Steve mentioned it earlier, it was whoever was at the, the bank manager's house. They ended up hostages. And that's what made this thing so incredibly dangerous as well. And so at the manager's house, it was a manager, his wife, the daughter, and the daughter's boyfriend. So now they're held hostages in that same pattern of holding them, interrogating the manager about all the bank operations, you know, what's going to go on at the bank, who's going to have the combination, and so on and so forth. And again, at, at this place, when they approached this couple, they identified them as, themselves as FBI agents, and they were in suits. Again, the wife, the wife's good thinking, says, hey, I want to see a badge. And they responded, we're here to rob banks and pulled out their guns. And now uh, they've got them hostage. And in this case, there were 20 bank employees that showed up at the bank and were held in a storeroom. And, and I bring that up again, because it, it's an example of how dangerous these things were, because you can imagine of 20 employees, what if just one of them got aggressive or tried to run or something of the sort, and it could have just been a bloodbath. Now we're past the, the, the September 85 robbery. They got 574000 And in July of 86, Connor and Doherty, they robbed the first independent bank in Hazeldale, Washington of 267000 In that case, the manager, wife, and their 20-year-old son was held hostage. It's that same scenario. And, and I, again, I'll just tell the listeners, can you imagine having these two armed guys in your house all night with your wife and, in this case, a 20-year-old son, not knowing what's going to happen next, not knowing if you're going to survive it, if you're going to live through it? I mean, absolutely traumatic. Remember now, we're in the, we're in the mid-1980s. So keep this in mind. There were no cell phones. Agents carried around a pocket full of quarters to be able to use pay phones. We relied on big old brick Motorola radios, our handy talkies, cameras shot with film, and electronics were transistors, diodes, resistors, and capacitors, right? So that was the time frame. And, and I want you to keep that in mind because as we're going to be talking about some of these investigative techniques that are coming up, keep in mind about what that really means and how amazing it was in this time period, what the FBI was able to do. In October of 86, it was learned that Butcher, this guy, Robert Barry Butcher, that I described earlier, he was in contact with Connor. Connor was contacting him at prearranged payphone numbers. And Butcher was in the Phoenix Division. He was down in Tucson. And Butcher had just gotten out of prison and he was on parole. So as Butcher's on parole, and Connor and Doherty are robbing banks. They're on the run from this prison escape. And now there's a tremendous lead because we found out, we've gathered information, and I'm using we in the collective sense. It wasn't me, but it was the agents down in the Tucson resident agency, Special Agent Larry Bagley. Now we've got Butcher. He's in contact with Connor. So we have a connection, right? Well, how do they know that he is in contact with them? I'm not going to talk about that just because there were some, some sensitive issues are related to that. Okay. So that's found out. So the Tucson resident agency, they, they filed for the first application and order for wire intercepts for pay phones used by Robert Barry Butcher. And it was based on that information that Butcher had been in contact with Connor and Doherty using pay phones. And it turns out that the attorney general of the United States, Edwin Meese in 1985, signed an attorney general order that gave the deputy attorney general of the Department of Justice the authority to grant emergency authorization to utilize the federal statute to intercept oral and wire communications. So this had never been done before. Because of that order in 85, the FBI now had the ability to get these emergency authorizations to tap pay phones or any wire communications. So that was a was a game changer and you'll see how this unfolds because of that. So 
we were very fortunate that, that that happened. Steve was telling me that there was a lot of cajoling to get the Bureau to go along with this and, and give, you know, work this authorization because it had to go to the Deputy Attorney General down to Floyd Clark, an associate director, and then it would come down to the SAC. So there was this whole chain and process that involved this emergency authorization to get these, these wiretaps. But what had to happen is 48 hours after that authorization was given, there had to be the traditional application, affidavit, and court order. And each one of these things, trust me, I know, each one of these applications and affidavits were at least an inch to an inch and a half thick of paperwork. So it was substantial. And Jerry and Steve, you know that the, the Title Three, you know, that involved a tremendous amount of effort. Steve, what you did in Phoenix with this new emergency application, was it one of the first times that they had been able to, to use this new policy? Yes, it was. And I think it's important to note, too, that uh, Connor and Doherty had both been added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Every effort was being made to, to apprehend these guys. Also, I think it's worth noting that FBI headquarters isn't always an asset to the field when they want to do something that they think is going to be you know, beneficial to their case. But in this particular case, um, FBI headquarters uh, and in, in the person of, of the unit chief back there, uh, even though he had assigned me the case uh, to find these guys, he was, Don Pierce, he was so helpful. And when he called me, when I was talking to him uh, at about this time frame, he said, anything that you need in finding these guys, all you have to do is ask. If you need attorneys to help with what Walt was talking about, just to just call. If you need surveillance teams, if you need aircraft, if you need SWAT teams, whatever you need, all you have to do is ask and we will get it for you. So with that, I knew that we had the entire backing of the FBI as we began this, this chase here. The first time that we actually had tapped these guys uh, pursuant to this emergency authorization, I was actually down in Tucson, as Walt mentioned, and I was down there in Tucson, and I was listening in on the conversation. Butcher was uh, talking to uh, Terry Connor. I mean, it was so clear. I, I do remember that it was almost like I could reach out and grab him there. It was so clear. With that began a chase across the country because it was determined that uh, they were probably in the Chicago area and were getting ready to uh, do a robbery in Chicago, and they needed that third man, and Butcher was going to be that third person. And so it was up to him to get back to Chicago and where they would hopefully hook up and then do a kidnap hostage robbery. So we kind of knew what we were looking at. We knew that they were back in the Windy City, and, and we knew that they were getting ready to do another kidnap hostage robbery. And the two of them on the FBI's 10 most wanted, it just put a lot of emphasis on this particular case. Now, this is putting us at the latter part of October of 86. And the information was received that, that Butcher's going to get this call from Connor and Doherty, and they were together. So now we've got this, this ability to do a wiretap. So essentially, our tech agents go out, they install equipment on these pay phones to be able to listen into conversation. But we also have the ability then to trap and trace where those calls are coming from. So now we know that a call is being made to this number in Tucson. Steve is down there listening in and, and hearing the conversation. And I can almost imagine how that felt, Steve, to like, I'm going to reach out and grab that son of a gun. Oh my gosh, I can hear him talking, right? But this trap and trace determined that the call actually originated in Sioux City, Iowa, and agents were quickly dispatched to that payphone up there. And of course, these guys use a payphone and then they get away from it and get a, a good distance away from it. So they get up there. It's at a, some kind of a fast food restaurant and they interview employees and show a picture of Connor and Doherty. And one of the employees picked out Doherty said, yeah, he was a guy that was in here earlier making a, a call from that payphone. So now it's absolutely for certain that it's Connor and Doherty that are talking on the phone, that are talking to Butcher, that are making these arrangements for Butcher to head up north towards Chicago, and there's going to gonna be a job. Well, during this time, Connor was actually sending money to Butcher, 
and it would be maybe several thousand dollars, uh, you know, $500. And they had a whole ornate system to be able to send it using false IDs. And, and, and it turns out the FBI had mail covers. And, and we know that that's uh, working with the Postal Service to intercept mail and, and so on and so forth. All of those things were in play, but they were unsuccessful because of their efforts to defeat such things. But he got money, and even at one point, Connor sent uh, Butcher some fake identification documents, and those false identification would help further these transfers of money and such. I do want to explain mail covers because I use them in my career quite often. And that allows the Postal Service to take note of who is sending the mail and who is receiving the mail. But it does not allow the FBI or the Postal Service to look and see what is inside the envelope or packages. Exactly. And in this case, there was different addresses that they had phonied up and such. And so the mail covers were unsuccessful because of that. So we're working through October of 86, and there's these phone calls back and forth and money and such that's going on. And we now know that that Butcher is, he's really involved in this thing. And he truly is the connection that's going to lead us to these two top 10 fugitives. Well, Butcher has been associated with a couple of folks. And, and now then we're talking once again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that. 24 7 surveillance. Our folks had them under surveillance, and Steve's folks down there in Tucson under surveillance for a number of weeks without being detected. And these guys were always looking for those surveillances. And, and I'm also going to say right now, too, that, that at this point, Doherty's common law wife that Steve talked about earlier and Connor's girlfriend, and I'm not really sure where they were. I think Connor's girlfriend might have been up in Oregon, but both of them had been subject of surveillance for over a year. So imagine that the resources that are being poured into this case. So when Steve said that Don Pierce said, hey, the Bureau's at your disposal, the machine went into full swing. And I'm telling you, the resources that were dedicated to this could only be done by the FBI. Only the FBI had that kind of capability and capacity. So now these intercepts are confirming Butcher's in contact. They're planning a job. And Butcher ends up with these associates heading up towards Albuquerque. Well, it was kind of a surprise move when they when they took off and the surveillance lost them. But as as it happens, you know, be on the lookout to go out all over the place and agents are looking and cops are looking and a cop in Carlsbad, New Mexico spotted these guys. Things get a little tricky here because the the marshals are working with these cops and there was some mix up in communication with the marshals headquarters that were running Condoc. They believed that they had an authorization to intercept a call by Butcher. So Butcher makes a phone call to Connor or Doherty. I'm, I don't re- recall which one, but he makes his phone call And in the phone call, he says, I'm going to, and he tells him where he's going. Well, they take off. Well, there's no surveillance on them because it's only the the cop and a marshal down in Carlsbad. And now Butcher and his associates have taken off out of Carlsbad. They don't know where they're going. Well, it turns out it was an unauthorized intercept. And we know what the fruits of the poisonous tree are. If we were to use any information that came from that intercept, it would have tainted everything down the line. Well, you need to explain why it was unauthorized. Because the marshal was in contact with their conduct headquarters and their conduct headquarters had talked to whomever and whomever said that the marshals had this emergency authorization to intercept the phone call. Did not actually. I, at that time, the FBI was the only authorized agency that could do that. So the marshal did not have that kind of authority. So now what we have is we have Butcher and his two associates are in the wind. And even though the, even though that communication uh, was overheard, 
that that information had to be quarantined. It had to be segregated. Nobody could know what was said on that call, even though it would have told us where Butcher was going to go. So what had to happen is Albuquerque then kicks in full gear. They've got, at the time, they have about 50 agents in that division. They put all 50 agents out on the street in Albuquerque, basically doing a grid search to now have to find Butcher. Even though the information was there in that intercepted call, they still had to do this grid search because the Bureau couldn't use that information. Lo and behold, they find him. I mean, and that's an amazing story in itself that they were able to find Butcher in this this city the size of Albuquerque, which is, I don't know, like 20 something square miles or bigger. But nonetheless, they found him. Now then we're in Albuquerque and we're we're starting to get towards maybe the middle or so of of November. More conversations are intercepted uh, now because they're back doing these these the, the intercepts, the authorized intercepts. This certainly this job is they're talking about over and over. It's going to be a big job, a promise of big money, easy money for Butcher. Butcher is extremely excited. He's now going to be in the he's going to be in the big time. Well, this whole payphone communication system was very precarious, to say the least. Right. So now you got Connor and Doherty, they're in one time zone and, and Butcher's in another time zone, an hour difference. And it was so precarious. And we can hear these guys talking and they're saying, okay, nine o'clock in the morning, call me at this payphone number. And then you're thinking, oh, please, somebody ask what the time zone is going to be. What time is that going to be where I am? Because we just did not want them to lose connection with each other. And so that that's going on and it, it ends up very precarious, but they were able to stay in touch. And part of this whole scheme was, is Butcher was supposed to get payphone numbers that were miles apart. And I think these guys thought that that added some other level of security because when you're traveling from one to the other, you could be looking for surveillance. If there is a trap and trace, then you're going to be gone and it's miles away from the other phone. So they had their 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 reasons, whatever that might be. But Butcher, he's a criminal, and he's not going to follow directions very well. So he took the lazy way out, and oftentimes he would find these payphones that would be clumped together, or they would actually be you know, maybe one on this side of the street and the other side of the street. Well, as these calls are going on, they're being intercepted, and the trap and trace is determining that they're coming from payphones in the Chicago area. Once again, this is demonstration of the FBI's capacity and capability. Agents fan out all across Chicago and the surrounding area to hotels, motels, gas stations, convenience stores with posters, photos, and descriptions. I mean, they're putting an all-out press on getting that information out there. Let me ask uh, Steve just a quick question. Have you talked your bosses in Phoenix to allow you to go to the Chicago area? Yeah, that was not a problem. And, and it's probably worth noting here at this time, too, that it wasn't just the field office in which we were in. We had surveillance teams, aircraft from different offices that were on Butcher's Trail. So it wasn't just um, one particular office here, but uh, several offices that had contributed resources that we needed as, as Butcher was making his way across uh, the United States to the uh, you know, Chicago area. And while why don't you mention a little bit about what happened there in Albuquerque? The case agent in Albuquerque was uh, Special Agent Nolan Craig. And and again, I mean, this is tremendous pressure. And just as, as a side story, I talked to this agent, Philip Lorge, and, and he's a new agent in Albuquerque. He's sitting at his desk, and all of a sudden, a supervisor comes out and points to him and says, Lorge, get over here. He goes over. He says, I need you to be the affiant on this, on this Title III application. Read it over, understand it, know it make some changes to it, and then we need to get the, a judge to authorize these intercepts here in Albuquerque. Well, it turned out, for some reason, all the judges in Albuquerque or in New Mexico were in Scottsdale, Arizona, at some kind of judges meeting, and there's no judge in Albuquerque to sign this order. So as it happened, the FBI jet, which was the director's jet, had just delivered the attorney general, Ed Meese, and his wife over to Phoenix, to Las Vegas for some kind of convention there. And it was on its way back to D.C. and they diverted it and brought it to Albuquerque. 
So that so this guy Lord, when I'm talking to him, he's telling the story, and he's a great storyteller. He says all of a sudden he was after he was sitting at his desk. Next thing you know, he's with the U.S. attorney, a steno with her mag card, and and Jerry. That's a familiar term to us back in the day when the stenos used mag cards. And I can't tell you what that is. I just know what it is. So now they, the three of them are on an airplane on his jet flying to Phoenix to get a judge to sign this order. And it's, it's, uh, it's a really wild story that he tells, but it, it gets signed. And now the, there's these intercepts that are occurring in, in Albuquerque. And the SAC at the time was, was Bill Bannon. And he's, he too is, uh, is a, is a really interesting guy to talk to. And I've, I've spoken with him. He said to echo what Steve said, just like that, they had 70 additional agents that showed up in Albuquerque. They had four SOG teams. He said, these guys were driving trucks, motorcycles, vans. He said, you name it. And all of a sudden they're all swarming on Albuquerque to follow butcher, just to follow butcher to make sure they don't lose him. So now we've got uh, Butcher. He's roaming around Albuquerque, going to pay phones, and and we're somewhere in in the in the middle or so of of November of of 1986. Well, as it happened, you know, poor planning, and you know, I mean, criminals are not known for being responsible citizens at any point. And Butcher is starting to run out of money. He's on the phone. And he's talking to. Connor, he says, Hey, listen, he said, you know, I'm out of money and I don't have enough to get going. And I know time is of the essence. So I'm just going to rob a bank here in Albuquerque, finance the rest of my travel up to Chicago. That conversation is overheard. Well, you can imagine now in Albuquerque, they're thinking, Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And, and I'm talking to the SAC the other day and he's saying, he said, we're thinking of everything. We're thinking about, we know what bank that he's casing because we've seen him casing the bank. We're talking about maybe putting all FBI agents in the bank as bank employees. As customers come in, we'll rush them to the back and get them out of the way. You know, let him rob the bank, give him enough money to get on his way. He said, you know, that was one thing they're thinking. And they realize that that's probably too crazy to do and even think about doing. So that all of this is going on, these machinations. Now, remember, I'm in San Francisco and I'm just the AO case agent. And all I'm doing is I'm sitting on the edge of my seat reading these teletypes every day. So I don't know what happens until the next day when a teletype comes in that has the transcript of Butcher talking to Connor, he goes, you're not going to believe this, but some drunk just left a wallet stuffed with money at the payphone. And now I've got the money to be back on my way. (laughs) And I'm thinking, wow, what What a coincidence. What a stroke of luck. Well, it turns out that, and that was probably one of the most clever things that I'd ever seen in all my years in the FBI, the SAC had come up with the idea to stuff a wallet, Special Agent Arturo Gonzalez, rest in peace, Arturo. But as he's been described, the very gregarious, outgoing guy, kind of, you know, enjoyed teasing with folks and stuff. So he relished in the idea that he was going to be the actor to get to leave the wallet because this had to be choreographed, right? We know what time Butcher's going to show up at the payphone. And, and we don't want to leave the, the, and again, I'm using a collective we, but the guys there, they don't want some passerby to roll up on it and grab the wallet and go on. It had to be Butcher. So Arturo was at the phone booth as Butcher arrives. He said he could almost see that Butcher's getting all anxious and, and full of angst that somebody's at the payphone that he has to use. So Arturo goes stumbling and staggering off, kind of hollering and yelling, acting completely drunk. And that's when Butcher goes up and he finds his his money. I still think that's one of the greatest stories ever that they got him on his way that way. And I told the, the SAC the other day when I was talking to him, a retired SAC, I told him, I said, you know, I said, Bill, that's one of the more brilliant things I've ever seen. It was, was really great. Now we're at the first part of December and this fragile communication system with these phones. I'm going to call you here at this number at this time so on and so forth. Well, you know that thing at some point is there's there's going to be a, a hiccup. Sure enough, Butcher's on one side of the street and he hears a payphone at the designated time on the other side of the street ringing. He runs across the street, gets there just in time for the phone to quit ringing. And he hears the phone that he was at starts ringing. He runs over to the other phone to try to answer it. The phone quits ringing. 
their communication system folded like a cheap tent. Now there's no connection to Connor and Doherty because neither of the parties involved here know how to get back in touch with each other. So what a dilemma, right? And just like that, the communication line is broken. So Butcher is seen by surveillance at several other pay phones, like he's waiting. So whatever backup plan they might have had actually did fall apart because he never ended up getting another call. So now we're at December 3rd, and I remember that date vividly because now comes a call to William Fillmore Crouch, a.k.a. Wiley Coyote in Concord, California. Guess what? That's in San Francisco Division. (laughs) You're in the game. I'm in the game. I'm Coach, put me in. (laughs) I got three and a half years in a bureau. I'm in the game on a top 10 fugitive case. So Butcher tried to actually had to try several times to get in touch with Crouch, and, and then he gets to talk to him. And it was one of those same things, collect call to Crouch. They end up having this conversation. Well, it's being intercepted on the other end in New Mexico, and Butcher's telling Crouch, I'm on my way to Chicago. I'm going to meet the big guys and a big job coming up. I've lost contact. Have they contacted you? No. Well, I don't know what to do. You know, I need to, to do something. Crouch counsels him and advises him to go ahead and go on to Chicago. And then probably Connor and Doherty will reach out to Wiley Coyote and Wiley Coyote will be the intermediary and get him back in contact. So just like you said, Jerry, I'm in the game. So I rush over to Special Agent Don Whaley. He's the principal legal advisor. And, you know, in each of our offices, we had our legal beagles. I can almost see it now, this anxious kid with the tail wagon. And I'm like, Don, Don, you're not going to believe this, but we need to get a Title III ready because we're going to be doing Title III intercepts here in San Francisco. And he looks at me and goes, hey, kid, do you have any idea what a Title III is? (laughs) Do you know what effort goes behind that? Do you know how much time, energy? And he goes on and, and kind of lecturing me. And I said, Don, believe it or not, I do realize that, but believe this or not, by tomorrow, we're going to be up on phones here in San Francisco. So I got the paperwork from Phoenix Division. Steve's guys send that up. So I have that for a template. I get the, the paper from Chicago and Albuquerque. And I set to work with Don Whaley writing up the application. We were in touch with headquarters, that whole thing I mentioned, the Deputy Attorney General, Floyd Clark down through the chain to the SAC, and we were getting these emergency authorizations to go up on these phones. So by December 5th, we submitted our first set of paper for a wiretap, and we were up on Crouch's phone in Concord, California, and a payphone that he was known to use. Well, the two associates of Butcher, they drop him off in St. Louis. And those two yahoos take off and head probably back south to either Albuquerque or, or Tucson. And Butcher has now, from his, his wallet drop, he now has enough money for a bus ticket to go to Chicago. Remember now, it's still under surveillance every move that he makes. So he's on this bus and he's heading to Chicago under surveillance. And now Chicago has to pick up this wiretapping responsibility. And I have to tell you that. The work associated with that whole thing was just crazy. Well, once again, now Butcher's running out of money, and he's talking to Crouch in Concord, California, in the San Francisco division, and Crouch is telling him, okay, I'll send you some money. I haven't heard anything. Butcher's saying, I can't just stay here. Crouch says, well, why don't you just come on to San Francisco, and then we'll figure it out here. So Butcher then gets on, on December the 6th, he gets on a bus headed for San Francisco. On December 7th, Connor reaches out to Wiley Coyote, collect call from Steve. Crouch leaves his house and he goes to uh, a payphone. And it's a conversation that we believe is with Connor, but we didn't have any way to intercept that particular call at that particular time. Another kind of a side note, and I don't, and I don't re- recall it, but at some point and in, in early on here, we needed someone to identify a voice on one of the calls and uh, special agent Duke Dietrich and rest in peace, Duke. He previously had arrested Crouch and was able to identify Crouch's voice on one of these phone calls. And again, that's an example of the 
institutional history of the FBI agents in these divisions, just like Steve knew Connor. The guys in San Francisco knew Crouch and had arrested him. And Max Knoll, he too was one of your interviewees talking about the Unabomber. Max Knoll, too, had previously arrested Crouch. So we had agents that knew these guys, and these guys being Crouch and, and his associates. On December 8th, Butcher calls to check in, and Crouch tells him, Connor, call me, and he's going to send some money to San Francisco so that Butcher can fly back to Chicago. And the call is again traced to the Chicago area. So that full court press in Chicago is still going on. Well, meanwhile, in San Francisco division, we're scrambling our SOG teams, our our surveillance operation group teams. We're calling on other divisions to send SOG support. Uh, We're getting uh, more authorizations for pay phones used by Crouch and or Butcher. And we put a listening device in Crouch's 1974 Cadillac. And Jerry, you know how tricky installing a mic in a car can be. Agents actually have to break into a car. They have to get into the dash. They've got to connect to power. They've got to get out of there and leave no trace and get the car back in order before they leave. And those two are really interesting things because we had a bunch of surveillance guys out there, all kinds of contingencies. And it was done while Crouch was at a, at a court-ordered computer school and the car was parked in a parking garage in San Francisco. Now we've got a mic in a car. We've got more listening devices on phones. Now it's December 9th and Steve once again is in the arena and he's in Chicago. So Steve, why don't you tell us now what's going on in Chicago? I had been monitoring everything that was going on from Albuquerque. Once he left Albuquerque and then shortly thereafter, I flew to Chicago. So I was in Chicago for a few days, and then on the 6th or 7th of December, we had a meeting there in Chicago, and there wasn't much that I could do as an individual, but I was able to give them a little benefit of my expertise and my knowledge of these guys and maybe where they would be staying. So we all knew that they were in the Chicago area. We all knew that they were getting ready to do a kidnap hostage robbery. So we had to find these guys, and uh, this is where... The FBI comes into play in that there's no other agency around that can do what the Chicago division did at that time. I gave them my take on where I thought they might be. We knew that uh, Connor and Doherty would split up and they would not be staying in the same hotel. That was just for security purposes. And I, I mentioned that I thought that both would be staying in separate motels, probably in an area, maybe in a suburb, and it would be close to a freeway. And it would be just like a regular type, nothing really fancy or anything like that. It's going to be like a Best Western, a Red Roof Inn or something of that nature. So with that, the FBI threw, gosh, over a 100 agents into looking for these guys and fanning out and going to motels along freeways and showing the photographs. And sure enough, in one area, I think it was near Arlington Heights, George Spinelli, an FBI agent out of Chicago, who subsequently came to Phoenix, matter of fact. But anyway, he was showing photographs to a motel back there. And the guy said, oh, yeah, I said, this guy right here. Initially, we we had a sighting that we thought it might be Doherty there, but that turned out to be negative. But he said that, yeah, this guy right here. And it was an alias. It was a known alias of Connor. Looked at the photograph, said, yeah, that's him. That was on the 8th of December. I had gone back to my hotel, and then I get a call that they found Connor at, I believe it was a Red Roof Inn back in uh, Arlington Heights there along uh, one of the main freeways going into Chicago. So an agent came to pick me up, took me over to where the the motel was, and came up into the room there. There were several people into the room, and we stayed there all night long. They mobilized the uh, Chicago SWAT team. They were in a van. They took up a position there just outside, not too far from the lobby area. And it was kind of an L-shaped motel. Well, Connor was on the bottom floor, and we took a room up on the top floor on the other side of the L to where we could look down upon the front door of that room. So I was up there most of the night. Then about 10 o'clock in the morning, the door opened. The guy backed out, locked the door. 
And when he turned around, I could tell that it was Connor. So word went out to the Chicago SWAT team there that uh, they had an identification. And uh, then the command was given to take him down when, when they thought best. The Chicago SWAT team bailed out and, and you know, they arrested him. And he was very surprised, Connor. He didn't offer any resistance. Even though you try knowing that Doherty is around someplace, you try and get out of that as quickly as possible so as not to alert anybody. We didn't get out of there soon enough and had Connor in custody and he was taken away. But we were still in the area and I happened to be in the uh, motel office when a call came in and the person was asking the hotel clerk, what's going on out there? I, I see all these cars and, and everything. What's, you know, what's happening? And well, it was, it was Doherty that was calling. So she tried to do the best she could to allay his fears, but uh, wasn't able to do so. And uh, we, we figured that was Doherty, but he probably knew what had happened that uh, Connor had been taken into custody. And, and so at least we had one. The thought too, I should note the thought too and discussion occurred. That was kind of a cold, dreary night where we had a little. Uh, snowflakes coming down and so forth. And the, and the discussion was that, well, if we see Connor, should we let him go? Maybe try and follow him and see whether or not we can find, uh, Doherty. And, but we could not get an airplane up. The weather was too bad and we would have to rely on ground units. And in a major city like Chicago, it was just too risky. We came to the decision. The SAC from Chicago was in the room as well. And after talking it over with everybody, we came to the decision that having won a burden hand is, is better than, than, than losing both. So we decided to arrest uh, Connor and see what we could do about talking to him about where our doctor was, but that, that didn't go well at all. Anyway, we had one guy in custody, but Doherty was still on the loose. So that's kind of how that came down. But that that's just a tribute to the Chicago division and the number of agents that they threw into that. You can imagine how many motels are located along the freeway in the Chicago area. That was a good ending, but we were only halfway there. And when I was talking to the Bureau back in Washington, I knew that Doherty could not do a robbery by himself. He just wasn't going to do that. That wasn't his MO. He had to have somebody with him. And uh, Butcher and Crouch were the main guys. And, and so I asked Don Pierce back at the bureau, I said, uh, you know, he's going to reach out to these guys. I know it. And um, he can't do a robbery by himself. Their plans in Chicago are actually down the drain now. So he's going to reach out to these guys and try and do a robbery somewhere else. So I asked for the continuation of the wiretaps. Don said, uh, yeah, I'll give you two weeks. So I said, okay. So we continued the, the taps, and of course, most of them occurred in in the San Francisco area. This was before Butcher is flying into Chicago. So where we're at now is now we're on December the 9th, and Steve once again is in the arena, front row seat to to seeing Connor get arrested. Well, Butcher is still on a bus, so he's coming to san francisco and the the night before or on december the 8th he was told that connor was going to send him money and that you know everything's still good and then once he gets the money he's going to fly to chicago and meet with connor and doherty well then december the 9th comes along connor gets arrested so butcher is on the bus and he's coming to san francisco crouch is going to meet him he arrives on december the 10th Crouch takes him, sets him up in a little apartment there in Antioch, California. Now everything, again, there's no contact. Doherty probably not going to be contacting anybody until things settle down for a little bit. So we've got Crouch and Butcher together. Now remember, we've got a listening device in the car. So they start driving around and they decide, well, you know, we might as well go ahead and rob a bank ourselves. So as they're driving around, they, our surveillance takes them to a bank and they're sitting out there and we're listening to them talk about, you know, okay, we'll get the rope. And then when the armored car shows up and they're making all these elaborate plans and they want it to be right after an armored car delivery. So they'll, they'll get the greatest amount of money right then at that time. So we're listening to this whole thing. And I got to tell you, that was very eerie as an agent. And I worked uh, bank robbery cases in San Francisco to be listening, actually listening to guys plan a robbery. 
So now we're we're going to into December 10th and we're going through this period of time and there's this conversation in a car that we're listening to. Again, we've got 24-7 surveillance. We've got SOG teams from, from all over the place that are there following Butcher and Crouch around. And at one point, the ground units, which were also a listening post in a car, listening post in an aircraft, they lost sight of the Cadillac. And the agent that was flying in an, an aircraft was telling about his spotter, another agent who's watching the car. And it's a white car and it's in San Francisco traffic, and they do not want to lose them. They don't want to be the people who lose Butcher and Crouch, in this case, at this critical time. So the spotter, and a pilot's telling about this, is sitting there in bumpy air, and the spotter is puking his guts right into his lap. Never took his eyes off the car, kept his eyes glued to that car, even though he was puking his guts right into his lap. So that's the kind of thing where there's story after story where agents are just giving it their all to make sure that this thing comes to a successful resolution. Well, Doherty doesn't call until I believe it was a 14th or 16th. And he calls Crouch's place. They they quickly set up their, their communication system again with pay phones. And by now, as a new agent, I was run completely raggedy because I'm doing operations orders for surveillance units. I'm writing these Title III packages. And at that point, by the time we finished, we had five Title III packages that had to be prepared out of San Francisco and filed. We were up on 11 lines. We had a mic in a car and we had capability of going up on 26 other payphone lines. So it, it was just a full sprint to the end here. Thankfully, we hear from Doherty. Doherty starts talking to Butcher. He tells Butcher, hey, you know, I'm going to get you some well, actually, it turned out Doherty asked Butcher for money because he needed money. And, and, and again, that's why I find mind boggling when they've, they've taken hundreds of thousands of dollars and he's asking Butcher for money. But he tells Butcher, he said, I need you to fly to St. Louis, meet me in St. Louis and we'll do a job. OK, now everything is focused on St. Louis. The conduct task force goes to St. Louis. The SWAT team's on standby in St. Louis. We've got SOG teams on standby in St. Louis. Steve heads out to St. Louis. Everything is focused on Butcher flying out to St. Louis to meet up with Doherty. So now this is going on and we're getting calls back and forth. Everything is, is going as planned and we're, we're intercepting all these calls. Everything is perfect. And now we're coming up to the 17th and Butcher's going to fly out the morning of the 18th to St. Louis. And kind of a, a side note, I had a very dear friend, rest in peace, Woody Lewis. He was an, an SOG agent in San Francisco. He stood about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, he was a Mojave Indian guy. Uh, so he's, he's dark complected and he's a big guy. So I faxed pictures because Butcher was going to lay over in Salt Lake. And because we weren't sure what flight he was going to take, the SOG agents, they bought tickets on every aircraft out of San Francisco that day to make sure that they were able to get on any plane that Butcher got on. So we faxed the photographs of our SOG guys up to Salt Lake. Well, guess what? Everybody wanted a piece of this case and Salt Lake wanted it. They wanted some little piece of it as well. So the supervisor calls me and he goes, you know, you faxed me these pictures of these SOG agents. He said, I thought surveillance guys were supposed to somehow be innocuous and blend into the woodwork and, and not be noticeable. He said, this guy is six foot five. He's got a head the size of a 10 gallon bucket. And you think nobody's going to notice him. <laughs> so, so after that, Woody's nickname became uh, Buckethead. But I insisted our guys were going to go through and take Butcher to St. Louis to the, to the eventual meeting with Doherty. Now we're coming on to the 18th. Butcher's going to fly to St. Louis. Everybody's ready in St. Louis. Now it's kind of getting strange because Doherty calls and he calls to Crouch and he's saying, I need to have the number and address for Butcher. And so Crouch is giving it to him, but he transposed one of the numbers on the phone number. And next thing, Doherty's out of contact with Butcher because he had the wrong number. And then he eventually had a call back to Crouch, kind of a comedy of errors going on here. But it's working out because Crouch gives him the right information. Doherty tells him, okay, go get some new numbers and make sure that they are at least 10 miles apart. So Butcher goes and gets some more numbers. Our agents are on them, finding out what numbers they are. These are, these are payphone numbers. Exactly. 
more payphone numbers. And then Doherty says he, he ends up calling Butcher on one of the numbers. And he says, I need you to get me some marijuana. And Butcher's like, what? He said, I, you know, I'm going to be late getting to the airplane. I need to get, get out of here right now to make it to the, to the airplane. And Doherty says, I know it's crazy, but get me the marijuana and don't worry about the airplane for right now. Okay. Now the spidey senses are starting to kick up, right? The agents and everybody's working this thing. The calls, the tech agents weren't able to trap and trace them out of San Francisco. So we didn't really know where the calls from Doherty were coming from. Well, at one point, there was a number that was a 9777 number, the last four. And Doherty calls Butcher at one of the payphones and says, I want you to make the next call from the 977 number. The tech agents are screaming, that call is coming from the 977 number. It's coming from the 977 number. Wow. So what was happening is Doherty was running Butcher around to to look for surveillance. And then when he told them to meet him at the 977 number, everybody's on high alert. They're trying to figure this out. And at one point in this, in this whole story, Doherty was down in Tennessee. So Tennessee is a factor in this thing. The SOG agents, it turns out they were making a shift change. So we had two SOG teams. San Diego and LA. We got the SAC. We got a supervisor that are calling the shots. We got the tech agent screaming. The call's coming from the 977 number. Butcher is going over to the 977 number. And when he gets there, the surveilling agents see a, a car with a Tennessee plate on it. They see a person get out of that car, go over to Butcher, who's standing at the payphone like he's going to get a call. And this guy comes up and taps him on his shoulder, and they hug. SAC says, take him down. And it was Docker. Wow. So the whole St. Louis thing was a ruse. It was a tremendous head fake. So thankfully, the SOG agents, they were ready. And the whole time, we, you know, we had told them, you know, you got to keep your vests on. You got to have your long guns ready. You got to be prepared at any time to be able to affect an arrest, whether it's just Butcher and Crouch or whether, you know, one of these top tenors show up, you got to be ready. And Jerry, if you don't mind, I want to, I actually have in my notes, the agents who affected the arrest, if you don't mind, I'd like to name them off because for an FBI agent, that's a big deal to get to arrest a top 10 fugitive. Um, Please do. We had, and these are, these agents are from the San Diego division, Paul Grudick, S.A. John J. Batley, Jeff Riley, Steve Lambert, Dave Crawford, Timothy Ryan, and again, those were San Diego SOG agents. From L.A., we had Ronald Wazinski, Ken Suhu, Rich Manwaring. And then from San Francisco, we had Al Robinson and Raymond Velez, and they handled the arrest perfectly. Long guns, everybody was, they had their their ballistic undergarments on. They were ready for this and arrested Doherty, as we say in the FBI, without incident. So he gets arrested. The woman. Nobody, the, nobody from San Francisco SWAT. We didn't have a SWAT team because we didn't know, we didn't know he was going to show up there. We only had SOG, all SOG. Then we had Al Robinson and Ray Velez of the San Francisco SOG units. Uh, they were there as well. So my partner and I, we run down to the computer school and we arrest William Fillmore Crouch. And of course, Butcher is arrested along with Dockery. So Doherty is now in the San Francisco division in the, in the office. And I'm walking Doherty down the hallway after take his mug shots, take the fingerprints. And he looks over at me and he goes, you know, I'm imagining that it probably took the very best you have to find me. And I said, well, I don't overestimate yourself. I, I'm actually been in the bureau for three years and I was assigned a case, just a rookie. <laughs> Ouch. So. I'm fingerprinting him, doing major case and taking his fingerprints. And and just as Steve said, I mean, he was an ass. Earlier in my career, I saw in a supervisor's office, he had a framed top 10 poster that was signed by the top 10 fugitive when arrested. So I had this really cool idea that I, you know, I wanted to get the top 10 poster signed by Doherty. And I'm thinking, you know, sign it. Hey, nice catch, Walt. <laughs> signed Joe. But 
as it turns out, I'm in there and after I fingerprint him and, and get him photographed, I try to get him to sign the fingerprint card. And he's like, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. My name is Webb. That's not me. And I said, roll up your damn sleeve, rolled up his sleeve. And they're neatly printed on his arm as Joe. And I said, well, it's odd, Webb, that you could, <laughs> <laughs> that you, that you tattooed yourself yeah. with the name Joe. But anyway, he was, he was, uh, as Steve described, he was an ass about it. So we just took him on and, and booked him and, and, and hooked him. But that was the day of days that he showed up there in San Francisco. So I go and I interview Crouch. He started his criminal career before I was even born. He looks at me like, hey, kid, you know, I'm not going to talk to you. You know, I'm going to ask for an attorney. And I said, absolutely. You know, and I said, I understand that. And I said, also understand I've been listening for you for, for the last couple of weeks and driving around in your car, planning a, a, a robbery, had a mic in your car. So I don't really need to talk to you. But if you want to get to know me, I get to know you. Give me a call. He ended up actually the next day calling me and he got a letter from his attorney saying it was okay that that just he and I meet. Crouch, because of such a vicious criminal that he was, and this this very storied and colorful history that he had, I go and interview him because he asked me to come down there. And I, so I went down and interviewed him and I'm talking to him. And, and one of the things he said, and it's, it's always stuck with me, he said, you know, he said, I really don't want to go back to prison. He said, you have no idea how good it feels to step down on carpet with your bare feet in the morning and to get up and be able to go to the refrigerator and have a snack. That always stuck with me. Such a visual that it was. You know, then he went on to tell me that this whole thing was, you know, it was Butcher and he was just driving him around. And so he was trying to mitigate his part in this plan robbery that we, we picked up on the mic. But as I was interviewing him, he had a like a boil on his arm. And I asked him, I said, what is that nasty thing on your arm? He goes, you know, he said, I got shot 13 times in Seattle. And he said, I was in a, in a lounge. It's kind of dimly lit. I was standing by the jukebox. I see these guys coming, recognize that they're probably cops. I'm getting ready for them. They come up on me. And I realize then that one of them starts going for a gun. I see his badge. I go for my gun. And he said, they start shooting me. And he describes this. He said, it's in slow motion. He can see the cylinder turn on the pistol, the flame come out the barrel. And he'd see the flame come out between the cylinder and the barrel. And then the, the cylinder would turn again in slow motion. He would see the flame come out the barrel, see the flame between the, the, the barrel and the cylinder. And he says, you know, as I was standing there, I'd never realized before that the flame comes out between the barrel and the cylinder. <laughs> and, and so these cops shoot him 13 times. And then one of them is clicking because his revolver is empty and Crouch is telling telling me, he says, you know, at that point, now it's my turn to start shooting because they're out of ammunition. And he said, but I couldn't lift up my arm. And he said, I hadn't realized that I've been shot 13 times until I look at the floor and I see this pool of blood. The next time I went to interview him again, the boil had popped on his arm and he handed me a piece of copper jacket. So those pieces of bullet would start surfacing and it'd, it'd cause a pustule, then it would pop out. He gave me a piece of copper jacket from the time that he was shot. I had a question for Steve. Have anything to say about, you know, the shock of being in St. Louis and all of this goes down? Well, I had gone to uh, St. Louis thinking that that's where Doherty was going to be. So I was, I'd, I'd been in St. Louis for a couple of days and we were, of course, hooked up with San Francisco thinking that we would get uh, maybe a trace as to where he was calling from. So we had people out in the field. And so I'm back there at headquarters in uh, St. Louis. I can hear a call come in uh, from San Francisco that they have him on the line. And information, I'm not sure who it came from, but uh, but I hear over the phone that they can't take the call back any further than San Francisco. And then I hear somebody say that, holy cow, He's right here in San Francisco. He's not in St. Louis. He's right here. So that's when things start scrambling, of course, in, in San Francisco. They didn't have time to get a SWAT team out there at all. They, they had to rely on their SOG people and, and they did a very good job. But of course, I'm in the wrong place in St. Louis. Once he was taken into custody, I get a call from Don Pierce back there at headquarters. He says, great job to all of you. Uh, we've got both these guys in custody. He said it was a, uh, team effort by the entire FBI, and we appreciate your leadership and so forth. And I said, well, thank you very much, and got it exactly right. That was an entire FBI arrest 
Washington case because we had so many people from the FBI working on that at one time or another, all kinds of different field divisions in, in the way of uh, you know support. And without them all, uh, we certainly could not have done what we did. It was a great case. So from my perspective, I left St. Louis back for Phoenix thinking that I sure hope that this is the final time that I hear these guys' names. And it was. Doherty is now deceased and Connor has been in custody for like 30 five years and he's over in a prison out in the California desert and serving um, what time he has left on this earth so he won't get out. It was a great case and for me. It was kind of one of those uh, life cases that you have. All I did was just kind of lend my expertise and, and uh, what I knew about these guys and, and their MOs and, and uh, what they would do and where I thought they might be and what the real work was done by, by the agents out there in the field. At this point, it was a fugitive investigation, and they were both returned back to prison. But were they charged with any additional crimes that occurred while they were out? I remember being up in Salt Lake City when they were being tried up there for the robbery in in, in Utah. And as Walt alluded to, that's where I got Terry Connor to sign a top 10 fugitive poster of him he signed it December 9, 1986. There's only so much you can you can charge a guy with where it becomes redundant, but they got so many years and it just wasn't feasible to charge them with every robbery that they had done. All right. So this has been a full journey. We knew it would be because of all the offices and agents in, involved in this top 10 most wanted case. I had a question for Steve. One of the things that we mentioned is that the marshals also had a top 15 most wanted list and that they were actually trying to apprehend Doherty and Connor at the same time. Can you tell us just a little bit about that competition? Because they really had more to prove in capturing them than the FBI. I mean, that was just going to be part of our normal course of business and trying to apprehend fugitives. But for the marshals, this was a way of them kind of saving grace and the fact that these two violent fugitives had escaped from them. Yeah. You know, for the most part, they were pretty good. Denny Barron was the U.S. marshal uh, that worked on the case for my uh, I mean, he's the guy who I dealt with for the most part. And uh, and they were good as far as sharing information with me. But the one thing that they lacked was the sheer manpower. I mean, their conduct task force might have been eight or nine people. And they might have been able to garner a few more marshals from the different uh, offices where we went. But by and large, you know, when we started in Chicago and did that search for the motels, there was nothing that they could do. They couldn't add anything. And uh, that was just strictly FBI because we could throw in a hundred agents or more with respect to this. And, and uh, so it was just sheer manpower overwhelmed them. And, uh, but they were pretty much involved every uh, part of the way. I think probably with the exception of what was going on maybe out in San Francisco. I don't know if the marshals were with you, you know, at all out there, were they? Well, well, actually, Steve, you're such a gentleman. I have a little bit different take. What's interesting about this, I think, is Danny Barron was kind of instrumental in that whole beginning with Butcher and, you know, the developing information. They had done a lot of work down there and, and did some really good work. And then Danny Barron had done the work when Steve was up in Colorado arresting Doherty. Danny Barron was, was that guy. But. The thing of it is, is the marshals were very embarrassed about the fact that they lost these two guys. And you can imagine that being the case. So they've got this conduct task force that's out there. And there were times during this case that things got a little bit rough. It was kind of like a maybe a rugby scrum at times, because also during this same time, the, the U.S. Marshal Service and, and Jerry and Steve, you'll, you'll remember when they were working to get our fugitives away from us. And, and when I say fugitives, I'm talking about the unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And for the listeners, what that means is if a state has a fugitive that they are searching for and they have probable cause that that fugitive has left the state, they can ask the FBI to get process. And that's a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And then we had 
carry out investigations to locate. Well, that was a bread and butter thing at the FBI. It's something that the, the FBI was very good at. The marshals wanted that, and they wanted it because they fancied themselves as the fugitive hunters. And in some, you know, they had some pretty good folks doing that. But as Steve said, they couldn't compete with the FBI and the expertise the FBI had. They also were looking at taking our substantive fugitives. When if we had a bank robbery, we got an arrest warrant. They wanted to be the agency to go look for those. Well, we weren't going to have that because. That's a critical part of a case is being able to arrest the bank robber, setting the tone, doing the interview, the whole thing. So we were totally opposed to that. Agents on the street are saying, heck no, that's not going to happen. You know, we can't let that happen. But anyway, so there's, there is this competition that's going on and things got a little rocky at times. Well, in San Francisco, I was friends with one of the deputy marshals and he came to me and he said, this has been assigned to me. He said, can you just have me involved in some fashion? And so I can keep them off of my back. I said, you know, you, um, absolutely. He said, uh, you can set at a listening post and I'll try to keep you advised as I can of what's going on so you can report back to your headquarters. But at the arrest, that was only the FBI was there. And throughout most of this case, it was the FBI. And as Steve said, with this significant resources, with our legal ability, with all the attorneys that we had to be able to put this process together for all these wire intercepts, the technical agents and expertise that we had to go out there and put a mic in a car to be up in San Francisco alone with with uh, up on 11 lines listening, 26 other lines ready to go. That's a tremendous technology capability that really no one else had but the FBI domestically to do that. After this thing was all over with, it was interesting because, you know, we want to be able to get along with our brothers and sisters and and other agencies. And in San Francisco, when our SAC did the press release, he said that the FBI and U.S. Marshals arrested Doherty in Chicago. It said, you know, U.S. Marshals and, and FBI arrested. So I think we gave them enough credit where credit was due. But this, make no mistake about it, this was an FBI case. Yeah, we had to work with them. And and, and, and for the most part, as, as Walt said, you know, they were fine. One interesting note, in Chicago, when we finally arrested Connor, it was the Chicago SWAT team that arrested him, of course, and took him into custody. But soon after the arrest, right there at the motel, we actually placed him in the back seat of a U.S. Marshals van. And it was the Marshals that actually took him away from the motel where he was arrested to be booked. And if you look at the booking sheet today, you will find that he was arrested by the U.S. Marshals and there's no mention of the FBI in that. So that's just, you know, something that, that happened. And, and the biggest part for me was just getting the guy in, into our custody where he couldn't do this again. So I was fine with that. It didn't bother me. Fantastic. I have actually done a number of episodes about fugitive investigations. And so what I'll do in the show notes for this episode, I'll put a link so that if anybody is interested in listening to more interviews about fugitive cases, they'll be able to access all of those episodes because it is a fascinating part of the FBI, how we're able to track people all over the country, all over the world. And it's pretty interesting to to follow, you know, some of the different methods used to capture these these dangerous and violent fugitives. Yep. You're absolutely right, Jerry. I hope that we were able to do this justice and get the story told. And and I will say to you again, and I've thanked you once before, I'll thank you again for giving me the opportunity to reach back into my FBI career and get to visit with Steve, Bill Bannon, and Phil Lorge, and uh, some of the other agents that I was able to talk to. It's It's been a really fun thing for me to get to do. I am so pleased that both you and Steve were here to talk about this. Not many agents get to be involved in the arrest of a top 10. And, you know, I got two people here that were able to participate, and it was fascinating to hear. So after this case, the SAC, Dick Held, brought me in his office, and he said, Walt, he said, that was an exceptional job, and I appreciate it. He said, is there anything that you would like to do? 
And I thought, wow, that's a pretty unusual thing in the FBI to get asked for a change what you want to do. I said, you know, boss, I'd like to go up to Seattle and work the Green River murder case. He said, all right, let's see what we can do. And a few weeks later, I was up in Seattle working on the, the Green River case. One evening, I'm sitting with a group of cops that are working on the task force, and the captain of the task force was a guy named Dan Nolan. And you know how it is when cops are sitting around and start telling some tales, and, and he starts talking about a shooting he was involved in in 1969. And he starts talking about standing toe to toe with this crook and they unload their guns on him and he's still standing after that. And I'm, I'm just like, what? Are you kidding me? So I made a trip back to San Francisco for, you know, for a, a home trip and then came back up to Seattle and I brought that piece of copper jacket. And one evening I was able in front of the, the Green River Task Force guys, I was able to present to him a piece of the bullet that was very likely the bullet he shot Crouch with. Wow. And so when he told you this story and you told him that you had interviewed and arrested Crouch, you know, for this big top 10 case, he must have been like, you know, what are the chances? What are the odds, right? And it's a small world. And it's an interesting world. And this story had all of these interesting vignettes, this whole Doherty and Connor story. Well, and then a follow on, I came back from working on the Green River murder case up in Seattle in 1988. I'm on a SWAT team in San Francisco, and we're all gathered up in a van waiting for an armored car to get hit. Guess who's going to hit it? Crouch and a guy named Carafa are going to hit the armored car. So I'm out there on a surveillance. Well, they end up not hitting it. And then in 1992, I believe it was, Crouch was trying to rob an armored car, and he got in a, a gunfight with one of the guards, and he got shot and killed. Wow. What kind of jail time did Crouch get on the top 10 case? Did Interesting. You should ask that because I packed up and headed out to the Seattle. It's, and you know how, you know, when you're young and you're full of energy and you got a million things going on, it's easy just to leave something in the dust. So I had the case, the Crouch case transferred to my partner. He was working it and I was off to greener pastures doing something else. So I'd, I'd forgotten what happened to him until I was preparing to talk to you about this case, and I went online, and I found an appeal because obviously we charged him with conspiracy to commit bank robbery. And he it wasn't an appeal. It was a a motion to dismiss, and the case was dismissed against him. And the reason was is that the judge said, we didn't know when this planned robbery was going to happen in Chicago. So all of these emergency Title threes that have been carried out from Tucson to New Mexico to Chicago to San Francisco. In reality, there wasn't enough of an emergency to be able to justify using that conversation from the car as evidence against him in that case. So it was dismissed. Wow. Which allowed him to be out to do these other armed robberies. Yep. Interesting. Now, in the first episode, we got to know Steve a little bit better. And now it's your turn, Walt. I'd like to know when and why you joined the FBI. It was a little bit different for me at the beginning. I am a member of the Blackfeet Nation of Montana. I grew up on reservations, Indian reservations throughout the country. My mom was a Bureau of Indian Affairs social worker. So through her career, we lived on these different reservations. Well, you can imagine there's no Uncle Bob who's an agent or an Aunt Betty who's an FBI agent. There's no FBI agents that are living in the community as role models. So I didn't really have an understanding that that was a possibility for a young Native man to to be an FBI agent until 1978. I went to a conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there I met Chuck Choney, another Native FBI agent, and Woody Lewis was part of that recruiting team. And I see these guys and they're in their suits and they're, they're tall, handsome guys and they fit the part. And it, I was so intrigued. So they gave me an application. I go back to Montana where I'm teaching school on a Blackfeet reservation. I start to fill out this application and it's like, who's your first grade teacher kind of thing. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is a, just a, a dream anyway, an unattainable dream. So I'll go back to teaching school. And I was actually a shop teacher. So I was teaching welding, drafting, auto mechanics kind of a thing. Put the application aside. A couple of weeks later, the principal comes to down to my shop and he's and he's just 
the blood is drained from his face. He's like, well, the FBI is here to see you. And I think probably at that time, the blood drained from my face because I'm thinking, oh, my God, what did I do? So I go down to the office and these two agents show up and I go, you know, you were visited with by a couple agents in Albuquerque and we're wondering why we haven't seen an application. I uh, followed up. I completed the application. I got interviewed. It seems I did pretty well on the interview. I did the uh, the agent entrance exam. I did pretty well on that. Next thing, I, I get a message from the FBI that I've been accepted. Well, and I think it was Mary Ellen O'Toole in one of one of your podcasts that mentioned she got caught up in 1980 with the hiring freeze President Reagan put on. So I got caught up in that same hiring freeze. And that's how I ended up being a support person down in Oklahoma City office and did that for a couple of years. And then thankfully, there was a, an, an agent supervisor there, a guy named Tony Reggio. He took an interest in me. He called back to somebody he knew at headquarters and said, why the heck isn't this guy getting processed? A very short time later at the FBI Academy, and we're all in uh, that classroom. And Jerry, you can remember exactly what that looked like, those tiered chairs. And it started out on the bottom. Everybody yep. introduced themselves. Well, I'm an attorney from such and such, a graduate of such and such law school. Next one, I'm an attorney, and I was actually assistant at attorney general for the state of, and the next, and on and on and on with all these attorneys. And we had a a PhD who was literally a rocket scientist gets to me and I say, I'm from the Blackfeet Reservation. And I've been teaching shop. Jerry, after I'd introduced myself in class, I really did feel like I, I didn't belong in this group of attorneys and accountants and nuclear physicists kind of a thing. And so it was February when I arrived at the academy and, and that evening I went out and, you know, you know what it was like at the academy there with all of the little scrub oak trees and oak trees. And I found a quiet place, curled up in the leaves and I wept. And I didn't sound very FBI like. I was so overwhelmed with what was going on and I had no idea that I was going to be able to make it through the academy. Imposter yeah. syndrome. They call that now. Exactly. And so I gathered my wits about me. Somehow I gathered the strength and I, I went back and, and it turns out I did I, I did well through the academy. I got out and went to San Diego and as I arrived there and and it was I arrived on a on a, a Friday and I was uh, putting my things in my desk and you know, pencils and you know, ranging my desk. I was nervous as I could be. I went in on Saturday and I was gonna finish my desk and, and over the intercom it says we have a ninety one new. Well, I knew what that was. The dispatch called over to my desk, knew I was in the office, said, can you go out and handle this bank rob? I said, yeah, sure. I said, tell me where the keys are to a car and where a car is. I raced down to closed files. I grabbed the 91 case out of there. I looked real quick through it. I go out to this bank robbery. We develop a suspect. It's on a Saturday. I come back into the office. We, we weren't able to arrest anybody that day, but I went ahead and I dictated my 302s. I did the green sheet. I had the, the film from the bank. I had everything in a package on Monday morning when I went in to talk to my new supervisor, who was the ASAC, Bud Colbert. I handed over everything and said, I handled a bank robbery on Saturday. At that moment, I knew I was doing what I was supposed to do. And that continued. Three years later, the capture of a top 10 fugitive. And then later in your career, you were presented with two FBI Shields of Bravery, one of the highest honors that an FBI agent can receive during their career. And you did it twice. On uh, the, the morning of uh, April 19th of 1995, I was in Oklahoma City. I was assigned to the Oklahoma City Division. I heard the explosion and even felt it. And I was 15 miles away from it. I knew immediately something was, was going on. I, I rushed into the house. I turned on the television and they're showing his plume of smoke coming from downtown Oklahoma City. I ran out and jumped in my bureau car, turned on the radio. And I heard one of the agents who was near there saying there was a, some kind of explosion at the federal building. So I jumped in a car, raced down there to the, the AP Murrah federal building and saw a sight that nobody ever wants to see. Went in the building, helping look for survivors, found a, a survivor, ended up working with another agent and some Oklahoma City police officers trying to dig her out. So I, I got a shield of bravery for being in the building after the bombing. 
it was pretty precarious. And because the building was actually still moving, it was one of those moments in time where all I wanted to do was be able to tell my kids one more time I loved them. Later, the same year, one of my informants says there's a prison escapee. He's armed. He's waving a gun around. He's really dangerous. He's on the verge of doing something really crazy. And so this informant says, I'm going to have him meet me at my place this evening. So I gathered up folks that I'd worked with on a fugitive task force. We rallied up, got down there. And sure enough, the fugitive showed up. We had a car chase that turned into a foot chase. The fugitive fired at me. And he was running towards where other law enforcement were coming. So I, I knew he had a gun because he fired at me. And I was afraid that he was going to come up on those guys and maybe have the advantage. So I'm screaming, screaming, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. And then I shot him and was awarded a second shield of bravery. I could hear the emotion in your voice, remembering the dangers of being in both situations. When you retired, you took a job that your parents, especially your mother, must have been so proud. You became the deputy director for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for law enforcement. Well, as it turns out, I didn't retire from the FBI. And because we were 1811 investigators, I was approached by the Bureau of Indian Affairs law enforcement program that was going through a complete organizational transition. And the director asked me if I would be willing to come and be his number two. Now, this was after I had 18 years in the FBI. I really wanted to stay for my 20, but it was one of those things where I felt like I just had to do it. And you're right. My mom, her career in the Bureau of Indian Affairs as a social worker serving our tribal communities. My father was a nationally recognized tribal leader. So I felt like it was a calling and I transitioned over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And thankfully, it too was uh, an 1811 position. So I was able to just transition my retirement. It was an interesting career as well and, and a whole nother dimension beyond what the FBI in terms of the, the mission and what we were tasked with doing. As it turns out, right after 9-11, because the Bureau of Indian Affairs is, is under the umbrella of the Department of Interior, I was called back here to D.C. to help the Department of Interior shore up its security protocols for the dams, icons, and monuments. And I ended up actually doing that for two years. What a fascinating career that you had. What a fascinating career that Steve had. I want to give you that opportunity to give us your last words. What would you like to say? When I first joined on as an FBI agent, I had an opportunity to speak with a seasoned veteran. And he said, kid, you do it right. This is like a E-ride at Disneyland. And you know what? Just as he said, it was like an E-ride at Disneyland. And that's the end of part two of this case review. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Walt Lamar and Steve Chenoweth and their bios. You'll also find links to the FBI website page about the Most Wanted program, articles about the hunt for and capture of Connor and Doherty, their official top 10 wanted flyers, a link to the movie Bandit, inspired by this case, and a link to more FBI retired case file review episodes about fugitive investigations. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, how to listen to a podcast. And don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to audio. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, A Manual for Armchair Detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, Fun for Armchair Detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, 
please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.